vehicles with people at the rear weighed down by packs and they're suddenly attacked by 5,000 tribesmen. The tribesmen have both the element of surprise and at that point considerable numerical superiority. Arminius has one further crucial advantage. Legions crossing difficult country are given protection for their flanks, auxiliary cavalry, Germanic mercenaries that he commands. And they have joined the rebellion. Varus cannot guess that the very forces that are protecting his flank will be the first to attack his legions. The warriors storm down from their hiding places in the hills. They are absolutely silent. Only the distant thunder of their feet betrays their presence. At that moment, the auxiliaries change sides. The attack finds the Romans entirely unprepared. There's barely time to raise the alarm. The Germans fight more with their bodies than with their weapons, a Roman historian says. In the chaotic confusion of civilians and supply wagons, it's impossible to bring up reinforcements. The tribesmen and the auxiliaries attack from both sides, giving the Romans no chance to regroup. The most powerful army in the ancient world is defenseless. There are no armies marching in formation. This is just hit and run. The surprise has been total. Centurions have been cut down even before they can gather their troops into action. They couldn't fight back. But what do their enemies plan? Are they after booty or is it a major attack? All they know is that the enemy are present in large numbers. And where is Arminius? Varus decides the only option is to press on. As soon as they find a suitable place in the forest, they will halt, gather the legions, and build an emergency camp. According to Tacitus, the Romans managed to advance through the forest. Then, all three legions worked together to build a temporary camp. No single legion had been destroyed. One battle had been lost. The war could still be won. Vargas, uh... At this point, Varus was still following standard Roman procedure. He built a fortified encampment as well as he could in the terrain and given the state of his troops. And it was the right thing to do, because the enemy was nearby and he had to ensure that his men could at least rest that night without having to fight off non-stop attacks. The wall and the ditch with sentries placed behind it was precisely what was needed to make an impression on the enemy and make them think twice before launching an attack. Behind the ramparts, they tend to the wounded. Ah! 
while the commanders consider their options. They realize their losses are worse than they thought. Eight cohorts have been wiped out. The choices are poor. Maybe they should make a break for it. But marching on could be suicide. Varus must decide. Betrayed by the man he trusted most. His commanders urge him to stay behind their defenses. Messengers can be sent to the Halton and Xanten garrisons for reinforcements. There's no alternative. They need help. Varus rejects their advice. They can wipe out the barbarians once they leave the forest. He instructs his commanders to abandon the civilians and destroy the baggage train. Nothing must slow them down. The legions will march on at daybreak. The orders are clear and will be obeyed without question. It is a serious strategic error. The Germanic forces immediately spot the burning baggage train. A scout reports to Arminius. The Romans have ejected the civilians from the camp and are destroying their supplies. Some of the chieftains want to pillage before everything is burned. They know they owe their men booty. This is their chance. Arminius is furious. They could lose everything they've achieved so far. The tribes have sworn to obey him. He promises to lead them to victory if they obey his orders. Arminius's achievement here was in making his non-too-disciplined forces follow rational, deliberate tactics. Many of them would surely have seen this as cowardice, and they would have had to restrain themselves in order to go along with his plan. Morally, Arminius's behavior may be dubious, but there's no doubt that he was a military genius and a man torn between two cultures. Realistically, he has no chance against the Romans, but he still went ahead with his attack. The next morning, the legions leave the camp in battle order. Varus abandons the civilians to their fate. Perhaps he expects the barbarians to massacre them and plunder the supplies and let his legions go free. But according to Tacitus, Arminius said that war is fought only against soldiers. This Germanic code of honor was based on sound reasoning. If Arminius spared the civilians in the baggage train, that wouldn't have been for humanitarian reasons. It was a great opportunity to take them prisoner and then hold them to ransom. Trading in people, prisoners of war, is perfectly normal in warfare, because people mean manpower. And that's extremely valuable. So I don't see that as evidence that Arminius was a man of integrity who was sparing civilians. He was simply being practical. On the third day, the weather turns. Torrential rain brings the legion's forced march to a halt. Their armor, now soaking wet and heavy as lead, makes the soldiers even less mobile than before. 
for Arminius and his men. This is perfectly normal weather. Cassius Dio writes, heavy storms broke out. While the Romans fought the elements, the barbarians moved into position, surrounding them on all sides. Arminius now unleashes an attack of appalling brutality. seem like evil spirits. There's no time for a heroic rearguard action. No time to look after the wounded. One chronicler wrote, Caught in the bogs and the forests, the Romans were butchered man by man by the same enemy they had butchered like cattle so many times before. And finally, in the chaos, Varus loses control of his legions. There are no generals left for the soldiers to follow. His army falls apart. In the space of 24 hours, Varus has faced two overwhelming attacks on his legions. He must have come to realize that victory is now beyond his grasp. He can only hope to avoid annihilation. One of his cavalry commanders finally reaches the scene of the massacre. He finds Varus at his wit's end. With no idea what to do. This could be the last chance to call for reinforcements. Pneumonius volunteers to break out with his cavalry to the nearest Roman stronghold before the horses are too exhausted to move. According to Roman historians, Pneumonius only wanted to save his own skin. He left the foot soldiers in the lurch and fled towards the Rhine. But fate took its revenge. As Paterculus recorded, death overtook the traitor on the way. Whatever Varus and Pneumonius may have planned, Arminius is a step ahead. Another trap awaits the fleeing cavalry. Not a single horseman will make it to the Rhine. Now, the legionaries waste no time to get moving. Nothing matters but getting out of the forest. The tribesmen are always just behind them. They know they only have to drive the Romans forwards. And the legions stumble blindly on. <laughs> 